Hello Hello there. there. Hello everyone and welcome back to yet another episode of Star Wars in a Galaxy watching all the Star Wars we can get our hands on. I'm Eli. I'm Jacob. And um, wow, uh, this is the first episode we're doing since uh, the live stream. Uh, This is also, by the way, our last episode of 2020. Um, This is the last in a Galaxy episode of 2020, which is crazy to think about. Um, And like, I, we just want to, Jacob and I want to say thanks to everyone for an amazing 2020. You know, we started very early into January, not knowing what this thing would become. And man, uh, we'll talk about this more on our year long um, episode, which is in, I think, two weeks from now. But man, uh, when we've seen what we've created and how many of you guys have listened or talked to us on Twitter about this or whatever... Thank you so much. We just want to say that before we begin. Um, but this week on Star Wars in a Galaxy, we watched the three Clone Wars episodes, Jedi Crash, Defenders of Peace, and Trespass. So, uh, do you want to summarize Jedi Crash? All right. So, Jedi Crash. In this episode, uh, we see uh, Anakin and Ahsoka and, and their clone and Rex and the 501st swooping in to save uh, Luminar, no, not Luminar and Dooley, I apologize, to swoop in and save Ayla Sakura and her clones and Commander Bly from a separatist uh, space ambush. And uh, things happen and and they end up uh, catapulted, they end up accidentally going into hyperspace and they end up crash landing on the planet Meridon. And they have to find help from the locals. So they find help from the uh, the Lorman people but they have to. They eventually convince them, since the Lormen are neutral and their chieftain is very. Uh, I think you're getting into defenders of peace. It's. Oh, I am. It, oh, okay. They just connect- crash land. Yeah, they just crash land. They crash um, land, and I don't know. I think it's a pretty. I think it's a pretty yeah. juicy episode. You know, I think there's some it's cool stuff to unpack. Probably my this. least favorite of these three, because like, and it's not because this episode is bad. It's because the other two are very, very good. Especially, I love Trespass. Trespass mm. honestly surprised me with how good it was, in my opinion. Okay. Uh, but uh, let's let's go to Jedi Crash. We got our fortune cookie right here. Greed and the fear of loss are the roots that lead to the tree of evil. What did you make of this? I thought it was a little bit overcomplicated. I said, like, I tried to simplify it up. I said, instead of greed and fear, then the fear of loss are the roots that lead to the tree of evil. I said... Greed and fear of loss are one step down the path of evil. That seems like it's kind of saying saying the same thing, though. Don't you I think? know it's just like, do we really have to make it that long? You know what I mean? Like I guess. the longer version sounds a little clunky. That's just me, though. That's me being <laughs> ultra nitpicky. Ha ha, clunky. Ha ha, <laughs> clunky. Oh no. I'm be- more I'm like a- ma clunky. Am I right? Oh my gosh, I'm becoming a ma clunky <laughs> fanboy. It's happening. <laughs> it's happening. I love it so much. You know. I think this this fortune cookie is kind of unfortunate because it doesn't really I feel like it doesn't connect to the episode too much and I think that's weird considering how on a philosophical level um and on an intellectual level I feel like this is one of the juiciest episodes we've we've had so far and there's so much to unpack but I think it, it it's trying to sort of cast the light a bit on the argument of a say are you saving one are you trying to save one person that you love dearly or are you trying to save the lives of 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 many more people even if that means uh, a trade-off and how that argument kind of and we see that played out we'll talk about that in a bit how that kind of affects ahsoka and anakin but i think they could have picked something else but i would i don't don't think it was the worst fortune cookie yeah it's pretty tied in yeah it's 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 good i don't really have too much of an opinion i think it's a little bit of i think it's a little bit mcclunky but um petition to call anything at ever again on in a galaxy mcclunky instead of clunky oh gosh i think we're gonna do it um it's gonna be the new moselle watch um oh no uh anyway so um yeah so anakin to save everyone else uh absorbs quite a bit of like fire like literal fire barreling at him he takes a hit he takes it that should have killed him 
Like, legitimately should have killed it. I, like, he has main character syndrome, so... And, like, you know, of course we know he's protected for Revenge of the Sith. But that legitimately should not should not have... He legitimately should not have survived that. Also, I don't know if you noticed the rip from Vader in Empire Strikes Back. Plot every course along their last known trajectory. Yeah, I, I didn't cruise. get that reference. I love that reference. Lo and there's another reference right after that. The breathing mask that Anakin has on to survive... Hear the noise it made? I know, that, that was a cool... Uh, that is some good foreshadowing I know, right that there. is. That was, I was like, that was some good stuff. In case you guys aren't catching up on it, uh, or aren't picking up on it, the breathing mask that, that, that I just spoiled it, that Anakin uses to survive his accident sounds like Darth Vader. Um, <laughs> and, yeah. 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 Um, definitely crazy. It, yeah. Uh, and so they crash down on Felucia. Um, we see Ahsoka has clearly, um, let's just say she's clearly inherited Anakin's penchant for crash landings. Oh yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah. How do they walk away from that? I don't understand. There's so much. There in are, Star Wars. There are so many. The crash landing is is to be completely honest with you. Probably the fourth trope in uh, Star Wars. It's yeah, the ship getting landings. blown up, crash landings, dressing up as the enemy, and vents. Those are the yeah. four. I think we found 100%. our fourth official one. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's Ma it, like absolutely catastrophic crash landings that they easily walk away from. Oh, no yeah. Problem. That's got to be it. I, I think I'm pretty sure. Um, there was a joke, there's a joke in like season two of the Clone Wars, which we'll get to soon. Um it's like, um, there's um Obi-Wan and Anakin at, um We never do anything my way, Master. We crash the ship yo way. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Like, that's I, actually yeah, from an episode I it. love. I'm really excited to get to that episode. Season two is called Bounty Hunters. It's maybe my favorite ad adaptation of the Seven Samurai into Star Wars, including wow. the Mandalorian. Um, all right but yeah I'm looking um, forward enough, to that then enough of that sidetrack um uh let's see do you um, want to talk about the uh do you want do you want to get into the main meat the, of this episode the whole um ahsoka has to leave anakin behind with rex to go yeah. uh look out for food and all of that stuff well before that i guess i want to mention a, a few a few things I had questions about that I wanted to bring up. First of all, I think that um, I, I've, I've been paying attention a lot to the visuals lately. Um, I'm not exactly sure how this has come about, but I've, I'm, I'm an absolute sucker at this point for the, for the background art, for the landscapes, the skyscapes, the, the planets, the big wide shots. I absolutely I don't think you're those. the only I one. Think I think Filoni's a big sucker for that. Yeah, I know. You can see it in Rebels. I was watching, and, I was watching and a like, little bit of Rebels All today. of his sketches and all of like the Filoni picturesque stuff have all these vast landscapes and like quiet imagery. You know, the one picture everyone talks about from the Jedi is the shot of the moon and the silhouette of Ahsoka holding Grogu. Um, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Like, Filoni loves that picturesque, vast, lush landscape. That's his thing. I think George yeah. does that too, but I think that's very a Dave. That very much a that's Dave a Dave Filoni thing. thing. Yeah, yeah. 100%. 100%. Yeah. So I think um, also, I, I'm really surprised that we don't see the super battle droids with the, the RPGs and the rocket packs make more appearances in the Clone Wars. Me space. too. That's literally something I wrote down as well. I'm like, those seem super like useful and efficient. Why do we see them literally nowhere where else in the entire show? I I thought that perhaps it's a it must be an economics thing, you know, um that rocket fuel is probably pretty expensive and the, and the separatist droids, they they run on the model of uh well hopefully we'll have more droids than the Republic has blaster bolts, you know? So Yeah. It, uh, but if they it really valued sense. their droids, I will say this, if they really valued their battle droids that much, then maybe Grievous would stop killing all of them. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Um, I mean, Grievous is more effective at killing his own battle droids than he is at killing Jedi at this point. Yeah, I have more proof also <laughs> that the battle droids may have a society. First off, the tactical droid is hilarious. 
with the way he drones on. He's like, this is taking too long. I think that's, I don't know. I'm a sucker for droid humor. I don't, it's super, it's super low hanging. I actually have proof cruise. that, you know, like we did the whole with Jared, um, it, a couple episodes back about battle droid sentience. I yeah. have proof that they're not as sentient as we may think. Not this episode, but the next episode of really? Defenders of Peace. All right. Um, you know, but, yeah. I absolutely love the the tactical droids and their uh, their sense of humor. I think it's uh, I think it's just great personally. Um, but uh, I I think I have some more proof that the battle droids might be a bit more sentient or uh, just it gives them more humanity. Um, we see a droid, uh, despite being supposedly programmed to be super expendable and unthinking, say with a uh, quite some uh, quite some trepidation and fear in their voice. I may say, uh, but sir, there are still hundreds of droids on that ship. We can't open fire. So I don't know. I, I maybe I am a little bit too. Uh, I don't know. That seems maybe I'm a little bit too best. ensconced with that idea. But that seems I don't know. I just. Best, I mean, but... it's kind of a kind of joking but um i uh and i i think it's i like to think that perhaps there's more to battle droids than we realize yeah um that now we're gonna get into the jedi not the the soak have and believe and combine stuff yeah okay yeah uh what are, what are your thoughts on this so, this is kind of where the philosophical meat of the episode so starts. ahsoka has to leave anakin behind um because he is injured and they have to go find help and all of that good stuff right there. Um, and I don't know. It seems to me that Ahsoka is learning the wrong lesson here. Um, I feel like... I feel like, you know, I did, did, I, did I think she had to leave Anakin behind so they could go get help? Yes. But I think the philosophy behind why was a little messed up. And this is where I have my issues with the Jedi. And again, I love the Jedi. The Jedi are my jam. They're, that's what I that's what I love in Star Wars. But the Jedi at this time have, I think, attacked me completely wrong. Because Ahsoka, because Ayla is the main person who has to convince Ahsoka of attachment's weakness. But I don't think attachments are inherently weak. That's my thing. Okay, explain what you mean by that. Do you, I do mean, you mean I, I don't think attachments strong. The relationship. I, I think attachments strong? can get in your way if you're not careful. But I think I don't think attachment is, or is is was or is ever going to be this villain that the Jedi make it out to be. I mean, you. Um, I mean, you say that, but the the evidence is right there. Look at Anakin. That is. Uh, here's here's what I, here's yeah. I th that's kind of here's the, the thing. Proof is in the pudding. Yeah. The thing is, I was way more against this when Rex wasn't there. Like, I didn't, we didn't know Rex was going to be there from the beginning, but when we found out Rex was going to be there, I'm like, okay, at least leave somebody behind with Anakin. But I think, you know, the idea of the Jedi are fighting a war. Who are they fighting for? themselves the republic i suppose i don't know good question the republic yeah sure let's go with the republic the republic is a very abstract idea they don't yeah. really like they're not really affiliated with the republic generally speaking before the war yeah. they're not really affiliated with the republic so it makes the constant flow of battles seem kind of like blend together i can easily see jedi just kind of losing motivation and blending in with the jedi like and how many yeah, jedi during the war 100%. How many Jedi during the war turn against the Republic, you know? Um, Barisoffi does it later in the Clone Wars. Pong Krell does it later in the Clone Wars. And, and what do they say? Specifically Barris. Jedi Council are all hypocrites. All the Jedi want is violence. And maybe... That's what she the, says, yeah. Maybe the violence would be more worth it to people. Maybe the fighting would be more worth it to people if they had something to fight for. If they had uh, someone explain, to fight explain. for. I'm not just suggesting romantic relationship either. Like, if they had friends who they had in the Republic that aren't Jedi. To, like, and like, you know, Anakin. Anakin is such an extremely effective fighter. And he is fighting for someone. He's fighting for his wife. His secret wife. Um, I think that's not that's not only he's fighting for. He's, he's, he's fighting for his idea of the Republic. He's fighting uh, for the Jedi Of Order. course, and they're all doing Ahsoka, that. But I Anakin. think... 
I, I think the most effective thing he's fighting for, I think the thing that keeps driving him is his wife. So so you think you think that the Jedi would have been more effective warriors if they had had compassion? Yes, yeah, I do. Interesting. Okay. I, 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 again, I think they're gonna have, they'd have to, like, really control how the attachment works. I think uncontrolled, it could lead to so many problems. But, if they did it right, I think attachments could actually benefit Jedi. Hmm, interesting. All right. That's just my personal opinion. I, th- I also think that that's why Luke's order failed in the sequel trilogy. Really? Took Ben away from his parents. I mean, he took all the other Jedi. You know, we see in the Rise of Kylo Ren comics. Sorry, I'm ranting. I'm going on. But uh, he, he, we see there, there's a bunch of other Jedi students training with Luke. Ty, Vo, Hennix, some of their names. Uh, and they're all taken away from their parents. Luke has seen firsthand how attachment can save someone from the dark side. And he's just repeating okay. the old Jedi's mistakes. Okay, interesting, That's interesting, uh, interesting idea. Um, Sorry, what were you gonna say about this? Because uh, did you? Mm, okay, I kind of like. I thought this episode was really interesting because I like the theme of uh, Ahsoka being, as you say, torn between Anakin and helping the rest of the group. And uh, you know, when we when we see Ahsoka not wanting to shut off the power because it will endanger Anakin's life support, but uh. Ayla making them shut down the power because of course that's how they're gonna that's how they're gonna save the rest yeah that's how they're gonna save the rest of the group I think that shows kind of how Ahsoka is taking after Anakin in in fighting in in uh maybe uh, tying into what you said about Anakin kind of fighting for for Padme and being very attached to Padme and then we see Ahsoka being very attached to Anakin we see that kind of become and and they're they're uh their operational style where they're willing to risk many people for their uh for the person that for like a, a small a group of people a person or a small group of people who are, who's very important to them like i think it opens up a very interesting discussion when um where's the uh, ala secure quote uh she says don't lose a thousand lives to save one life first of all what would anakin say to that hmm I, I don't, <laughs> clearly Anakin, yeah that's the problem uh, you know, with that what, what do we what do we see anakin do what do we see anakin do with his wife <laughs> what do we see yeah, anakin do with about that. And, then, and the nightmares and oh my gosh he that's kills just, children that's just so that's just so bad for anakin anakin he is not kills happy. children to save his wife from dying which he inadvertently does anyway um so well, yeah you know, not not good for not good for anakin <laughs> Not good at all. Not good at all. If you watched our live stream that we posted part of um, in our last episode, um, Anakin killing younglings came up a shocking amount. Yeah, it's a it's such a meme at this point. It's frightening. Um, Yeah, I I feel like like that's an interesting dilemma. Like, how do you weigh risking many lives to save one life, like the Jedi repeatedly do with with Anakin and all their rescue missions, even if that, and then how does, how does that become more complicated when, what if this one life that we, that we see has the potential to save uh, many more people because yeah. it's someone as, 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 as powerful and, and dedicated as Anakin, you know, or any Jedi yeah. for that matter. There's a train metaphor. I forget the train. Um, it, it, it's, uh, I know it's a part of the, TV series The Good Place. Um, ah, The Good Place, yeah. Where you derail, where you like, you can kill one person to save like 10 people on a train by diverting a track. And like, do you do it? Yeah, yeah, it's like the, it's like the trolley problem. The, the trolley problem, that's what it is. There we go. Yeah, um, so it's, total, it's totally the trolley problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I like them asking that question. Um, you got a lot more philosophically out of this episode than I did, I think. Um, my I philosophical so. stuff comes out of Trespass. I'm very excited about Trespass. Um, All right. It, um, yeah. That, that'll is, be interesting. It, it surprised you know, me. 
quite a bit. Yeah, and I think I think another thing that we see, I think this episode is interesting because we kind of see the same struggle uh, being born out in Ahsoka that Anakin has a lot, which is how do you uh, how do you balance like the individual versus the group if like you're if you're so attached to the individual. Should we go on to Defenders or do you have more? Yeah, let's go on to the Defenders of Peace. Okay. Um, Forge and Cookie is when surrounded by war, one must eventually choose a side. What do you think of this? Uh, what do you think of this Fortune Cookie? I don't believe it. I'm you don't? Okay. skeptical about this. Um, there's a quote I've, uh, I was watching Rogue One recently. Uh, it was Saw, Guerrera, and Jin were talking on Jeddah, you know, um, and Saw says to Jin, you can stand to see the, imp- something along the lines of, you can stand to see the Imperial flag reign across the galaxy. And Jin says, it's not hard if you don't look up. Yeah. Um, you know, we jump to The Last Jedi. Uh, these arms dealers, uh, DJ, th- these arms dealers made, uh, fortunes selling to the, to the bad guys and yeah. the good guys. It's all a machine, partner. Live free, don't join. Join. So I don't think you have to choose a side. I think there are ways not to choose a side. Now, I think oh, choosing a side is the, is the right thing to do. But I don't think there's any obligation for you to choose a side. Interesting. All right. That's just. I guess you're right. Yeah. It's opinion. it's kind of there isn't. Yeah. I guess I, I guess. But it, it often requires, still like making a, making a difficult. Choice. And I know DJ sells them out to the first order, and I know Jin eventually joins the rebellion but at those at that state in time neither of them knew that they were going to do that jen was um helping the rebellion because they get her out of jail and dj was still kind of ambiguous on whose side he was on and only sold them out to the first order because it would make him rich so um you know that's just my take on it um i will say Here's a low hanging fruit that I love. This is yeah. this is some great low hanging fruit right here. The main antagonist of this episode is named Lock Durd. Um, Lock Durd, yeah, yeah. Who is voiced mm-hmm. by George Takei, who is still really? on Star Trek, which is That's believe right, it or yeah. not, the first time a Star Trek actor has appeared in Star Wars. The first time, really? Wow. The first That's surprising. time. Yeah. You know, I would have assumed. I would have assumed there'd be it more would overlap. Happen uh, sooner. Yeah. No. I guess uh, not. But I love I love George T.K. as Dirt in this. I love him. He's great. I think he does a good job of making Dirt almost cartoonishly evil. Like you know yeah. what I mean? But kind of it, but kind of in a funny in a funny it, like way. Like a little bit over the top. It's um, clear that Dirt is like Yeah. Like he's also not did the you top notice that um Dirt was uh, before the testing of the defoliator tank, Dirt was standing up on like a platform and with the battle droids down and he was basically doing the Huck speech, which of course is a reference to Hitler. In oh my gosh, no, that, yeah, don't don't yeah, don't make me talk about that. I thought that was very heavy handed. <laughs> I I know this was before Huck's, but um, uh, but I literally wrote down in my notes: today is the last day of the Republic. Last day of the Lerman, more like. Y- yeah. Um, but I, I I like that reference. I think that the Lerman Village gives us the opportunity to talk about um, the the Lerman kind of um their uh their, their view of things. You know, yeah. their chief is super uh super super duper uh pacifist, kind of yeah, kind of almost aggressively neutral. Like he doesn't. Yeah, I was I I even... use the word aggressively somewhere here. Let's see. Um, where does um seems almost too insistent on wanting to be peaceful um yeah yeah i i like the dilemma in this episode about you know he he says he literally says to ala secure's face jedi are no peacekeepers and after only half a season of the show i can't say i disagree you know what i mean yeah, I guess I do. <laughs> Jedi have not been very good at keeping the peace and have only been pretty good at fighting wars. 
at this point. Um, yeah, I think that that's kind of like that's kind of just explored in this episode, and I think that's interesting. Yeah. It's an interesting message because it's basically saying, yeah, fighting is worth it if it's for a cause you believe in. That's what this episode is. Yeah, that's I think what that, a, I think that's a fair uh, that that's a know, that's a fortune cookie right there. That's, I think it brings that's up, the better fortune cookie. Fighting is worth it if it's for a cause you believe in. Yeah, I think that um, I I think that uh, we see the theme that 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 the Star Wars creators love to go back uh, to, which is you know, are the Jedi and the Republic good or not? Are they are they peacekeepers? Have they overstepped their bounds? Are they warriors? Are they losing their way? You know all that good stuff but i'm gonna be honest it gets tiresome after a while like it, it is an interesting question and i think that it is very uh it is very juicy and there's a reason they keep going back to it and it, and it is a very interesting topic i think and a uh, I, question that you can discuss yeah. a lot but i feel like after a while it feels like a to, to quote luke skywalker it feels like that was a cheap trick it's like oh they don't know what to do so maybe they're just gonna maybe that's why they're 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 playing the uh you know, it feels like they're just playing the uh, playing the moral ambiguity card, you know? Yeah. I will point out, I will point out that the only reason it felt old in an episode, for example, like On the Wings of Kira Dax from The Bad Batch is because they'd done it so many times before that. And what episode did they start doing that? This one. You know what I mean? So yeah. this one's technically the first one. We only yeah, say it's it... tiresome now because we've seen all the other ones after it. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I think that um, I think that it that, that definitely it, it, it's definitely not a knock against this episode. To be sure, it's not. I yeah, I don't I don't really have beef with this episode for that. But I do think that overall, they need to start if they're going to keep doing this thematically, and kind of making a ma making that like their thing, like this whole moral ambiguity thing, and try and get that to interest us. They, I think the some creators that think about doing that need to start. Uh, they need to start kind of broadening it and and start to add something else to the discussion to make it a little deeper, and and to just to vary it up a little bit because it ends up being kind of the same questions, yeah. like the exact same questions over and over again. And you know, I think that this, uh, I think the discussion between Ala Secura and the Chief is really great. Yeah, between Ala Secura and Tiwat Ka, that's a, in the medical tent. That's a great discussion. I think even if you're not going to watch the rest of what we're talking about, definitely just watch that one scene for sure. Yeah. Um, but I think that is one of the more interesting permutations of this theme. But I got to say, it really is starting to get old as yeah, I, a I few years that. down the line. And we start. Yeah, I understand. It feels and like it, just, it's probably also, you got you to remember, it's because of, uh, you know, the rewatch and all of that. Um, yeah, it is a rewatch. You're right. Uh, and yeah, no, but I, I get it. I here's my thing about battle droids maybe not having as much sentience as we think they do. All right, fire away. Do you see what they do to that village at the end of this episode? That is true. I it's mean, vicious. I mean, literally, my notes say that's the other great thing about having mindless battle robots as villains. They will literally do every anything like. You know, let's compare it to another scene that has a very different result. The attack on the Jakku village at the beginning of The Force Awakens. One of those troopers actually does wake up. FN-2187 actually does wake up from the atrocities that they're committing. Um, oh, yeah. But forget. there's no opportunity for the battle droids to, um, to uh, learn and, and develop and wake up. We see that in the season seven episode, uh, Unfinished Business, where Mace Windu stands on top of that literal high ground and says to the droids, you know, I've killed thousands of you guys, and I will kill you all the same, but I will let you go if you just drop your weapons. And none of them do it. None of them do it. This is three years and seven TV, TV seasons of the battle droids just being swept aside and Mace says, hey, I'll let you go if you just drop your weapons and they don't do it. I mean, it's in their programming, but like, yeah. you have to admit the fact that he does that does seem to suggest that the, 
the, the droids in Star Wars have they're more than just machines maybe at this point even if even some of them only a little bit I feel like that kind of reinforces the idea if even no but none of them do it that's the other that's the thing well but they are still robots but you know it yeah. uh the fact that they're being treated like that I think um yeah you know it is kind of it, it is kind of my running joke that the battle droids have their own society but um I think that droids overall it's 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 if they hadn't been shut that. down at the end of Revenge of the Sith, I do wonder what would have happened to them. Like Ro- like Roger. And like, R-O-G-R. From Trenches frankly, Trenches. like the droids on Agamar in Rebels. Um, yeah, yeah, totally. In The Last Battle. They were surviving on their own with Kalani for like, what was that? It was a while. 15, 16 years? I, I, there are so many good uh, stuff. Um... First of all, let's get to the fortune cookie, don't you think? Yeah, all right, we're going on. Let's do it. Fortune cookie. Arrogance diminishes wisdom. I think the fortune cookie sucks. Um, I, think, I think this fortune cookie really sucks. I think this episode is so <laughs> juicy, and it, it's yeah. it's one of the more much more entertaining and interesting episodes, like phil- philosophically as well, that we've had so far. But dang, yeah. it just... That fortune uh, cookie here, is like here are two like, alternate wait. fortune cookies that I have uh, can't come up with. Okay, now you guys are a fortune cookie guy now. Wow. <laughs> hey, two of these, two of these three fortune cookies really sucked. So, um, you know, uh, here we go. You had to uh, do what you had to do. War may be necessary, but peace is worth it. Or I like this one: a war prevented is a peace sustained. Hmm. I, yeah, I, I like the I like the first one. I like, I think the first yeah, one. Yeah, I think fun. both of them are a merit. I, yeah, more baby necessary, but peace is worth it. Um, there's some really juicy stuff in this episode. I love. Uh, first of all, um, so we're so I don't know if you noticed this. I um, you know, season one of the Clone Wars often gets the reputation of being very goofy, of being very silly. Not I that, think it is at points, but this yeah, is definitely this weird. is a serious yeah. tone. I noticed this a is serious. complete tone switch in this episode, and I loved it. I loved that we're that even now at the end of season one, we're starting to get into these deeper storylines that have more consequences and moral ambiguity and all of that stuff. I don't it's, think there was any moral ambiguity in this particular episode. Though. Not moral ambiguity, but like moral questions and questions about ethic, uh, ethics, and all that kind of stuff. And like, oh yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. First of all. Did you notice um, uh, clone helmets on spikes? Yeah, I thought that this did entire that, episode did, felt like did, a. Oh, oh, sorry. Go on. Did that remind you of anything? Um, in particular. Oh yeah, it didn't remind me of Mandalorian. Heads on spikes, Mandalorian, season one. Yeah, I felt that, like this. In, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I this entire going. episode felt like an allegory for um, imperialism or or maybe colonialism. Yeah, I, I think there is a lot of stuff there. I have another idea for theming for this episode, but I definitely see a lot of the talls are treated like Native Americans were a couple hundred years ago. It does seem like they even call them savages a couple times, which seems a little. There's on a the ton mark. of yeah. We can, I can yeah. get into it more later when we start to go through the episode. But yeah, there's a ton of stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, but what 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 what, what is your take? I want, I'm curious to hear what you think. I uh, yeah I definitely see the imperialism ones but I love actually so it's funny um we'll get into this later um I I want to go the episode through but I'll mention to you when we get a little deeper into it how I think this episode fits better with Defenders of Peace than Jedi Crash does. Oh, interesting. I it, I think it's a bet I think if you watch these two in an arc I think it would actually be better than Defenders of Peace and Jedi Crash. Because they're kind of the opposite, if you really think about it. Um, yeah. And I love it. Uh, I love what it says um, about war and the price we pay for it. I also want to mention Pantorans. I love the Pantoran society, and I wish we got to see it half as much as Mandalorians. We've gotten to see so much Mandalorian stuff, when, and they were introduced in Clone Wars. You know how many episodes we got with Pantorans in the Clone Wars? How many? One. Two. Two. What's the other one? This one and Spear of Influence from season three, which is oh. a really good episode as well. 
What is it um, about Pantoran society that uh, that interests you? I don't know. I just think there's they have some really cool characters. I love Senator Chuchi. I hate Senator Cho, but I love to hate some Ch- uh, Chairman Cho. And then yeah. the next I mean, guy they get as chairman is a guy named Chairman Papanoida. Ah, and, and he's a baron. I thought he's a baron. He's also a chairman. Oh, uh, okay. He's also the chairman of Pantora after Ch- uh, after Chicho's death um, in this episode. Oh. Um, but uh, yeah, he believe it or not, Baron Papanoida was in Revenge of the Sith. Yeah, and he's guess um, who plays him? George Lucas, right? George Lucas. Um, and it's actually funny because uh, his daughters, Katie and Amanda, play his daughter, ha- play Papa Noida's daughters in the Revenge of the Sith. And they're also in the Sphere of Influence episode, too. Chi Ikwe and Cha Manwe, Papa Noida. Um, wow. Real- Sorry, I'm so excited to get to that episode. Sphere of Influence is a really good episode. Really? And it's oh, also standalone. It's standalone, too. So it's yeah, not it part of any arc. Um. Good point. But anyway, enough about that episode and on to this episode. Um, yeah. Uh, there's a lot. So let's talk about Chairman Cho. He's yeah, a very go. fascinating character to me because he seems so set in his ways. He seems so willing. You know, there's this quote I wrote down. Senator, I am willing to fight and die for my people. Yeah, um, but but I think the important thing about that quote is that he's trying to he's trying to guilt uh, Rio Chuchi, the the other he's trying to guilt Senator Chuchi into a uh, into following him. I think that's really a commentary also. Well, also na- I think that's about the commentary on nationalism. Now, no one wants to be seen as unpatriotic, so people go or so people will go go uh they'll they'll go with uh, really uh some really crazy ideas and and really crazy initiatives because they don't I, want to be the, yeah. they don't want I to think, be the chaotic one. Actually, here's the quote um, I will get from this um, episode. I wrote this down at the end um, from Hamilton. Dying is easy, young man. Living is harder. Um, it, it takes a, it takes a hero to die for your people, but it takes a true hero to live for them. Yeah, I think that's an interesting quote. I'm I'm not quite sure what they meant by it. I think maybe they could have phrased what they were trying to say a little better. But overall, like, yeah, it's a really a uh, it's an uh, it's an interesting idea that yeah that, like uh, martyrdom isn't always the ultimate uh note of like isn't always the ultimate form of service. Yeah, especially if we'll we'll get to so um it's and yeah so the basic plot of the episode is there's this pantoran controlled moon called orto plutonia yeah and the pantor and chairman cho is so dead set on controlling the planet because he thinks it's property of uh pantora and it's occupied by these people called the tals who he thinks of as savages and uncultured so he thinks that he could just wipe off the planet like that Um, like can i just say that I think what? the Tals are badass. The Tals gotta... are cool. I like them. I think we should see more of them. Um, but, of course, um, my favorite part of this episode, and it's not even my favorite, I just find this so weird. I mean, I know Chairman Cho is bad because of the whole, you know, he wants to make violence against the people who, like, hasn't done anything to him. But he yeah. also, like, completely cherry-picks how and when the Republic should get involved with this stuff. Oh, completely, because he's he's completely it, manipulating. No, no, I but I love the extent to which he cherry picks. He's like, yeah. I don't want you to get involved with this, but your troops are now my troops. Yeah, exactly. It's because so, they're on my planet. I'm like, dude, yeah. come on. Well, it's it's. I think to me, it's obvious that he knows he knows that it's the towels. He he doesn't think it's the separatists, but he wants. Even after the, the Republic knows it's know it's the towels. He still insists on using their resources, but not having them intervene at all. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's the I mean, most convenient cherry picking I've ever seen. Well, yeah, that's like, yeah, yeah. that's what he does. Yeah. Um. So, uh, yeah. So Obi Wan and Anakin want to try negotiation, and Cho is very resistant to that idea. Um. And as we see in the episode, 
the clone troopers and the Pantoran soldiers are no match for the Tals. There are just too many of them, and they're just too good at fighting. Yeah, they're they're um, they're great warriors, and they're on their home turf. You know, they're mo- yeah, they're they, motivated. They know their they're area. Fighting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I heard somewhere uh, someone I heard someone say uh, saying that a uh, uh, a ten or a one, one soldier fighting for their home is worth ten uh, ten mercenaries, and I think that's that's very true in this in this case. Yeah. Also, here's another thing I find interesting. Chairman Cho does not want to retreat when his army is doing badly. Oh no, like, I think that's a reference to the... Uh, what's his I, motive for that? I think he's just super... Uh, he's, he's, I think clearly he's kind of just super arrogant and he, uh, he doesn't want to give up. He doesn't want to... Like he, he, I mean, he sees the yeah. pan, he sees the Talos as subhuman, not yeah. sentient, not deserving of of, of respect or anything so i think he that that to me is, is is clear why he wouldn't want to like show like he wouldn't want to in any way admit that they'd bested him and 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 yeah. saying sounding the retreat would admit it i think it's also a reference to how um i think it's i think it's a reference to the 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 cavalry um you know in a in the old the, the old west um in the 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 brutal um the, the brutal violence towards uh indigenous americans the united states government had the uh the cavalry and often these cavalry guys these captains would refuse to retreat for example fort apache the, the cavalry officer famously died because he he simply refused to retreat and and i think that building on that you know we see his uh i i happen to know a, a bit what the u.s cavalry uh in the, in the 1800s looked like and and his uniform is kind of a stylized version of the u.s cavalry outfit so i think this episode i I, I would i would definitely say this is like a this is like a metaphor and and maybe not so much a commentary on at least it's a it's a metaphor of the um the more new uh more more uh humanitarian way of looking at a at the at the events of uh colonialism and imperialism i also think there's probably a touch of vietnam here just because george also, lucas was very inspired by vietnam like the whole being outnumbered in a territory that's not your own going there for ambiguous reasons not everyone agreeing on why we're going there that's that seems very vietnam inspired of course i i'm not denying the native american and, and the united states government parallel to it but i also think you know, George grew up in like the Vietnam War times, and I, I think there's always a bit of Vietnam in a lot of the stuff he's talking about. Yeah, probably. Uh, uh yeah. My one of my favorite lines is um when uh, when Chairman Cho is about to die, he says, "Peace never. I died for our people." Um. And I love the idea that he thinks he died for his people, but what he really did is he died for his vanity. Yeah, and he and died his, for his uh, and and his unjust ideas. He died for nationalism, yeah. and he died for basically yeah. uh the basically like he he died for for like pretty much for racism in Star Wars. He died for like the most straight up space racism that we see in Star Wars. Oh, absolutely! Much. Yeah, no kidding. Like there's so many parallels. He just uses all the colonialist and all the imperialist uh, uh, talking points from the from from the United States government, from uh, yeah. British, you know, going back to the the New World and and the scramble for Africa. You know, he first he yeah. says uh, first he says like um there's no one here. This is an uninhabited planet. Which is, is not uh, true, but that's what that's kind the, of the US government said about Native Americans. Yep. Yeah, and that's what that's what Ameri- that's what a lot of people thought and and yep. or and kind of said. You know, he says, um, and then after that he says, Well, they're clearly interlopers, obviously also not true. And then finally he just says he just kind of makes the they're argument savages. they're not human, they're they are too dangerous to coexist with. So Yeah, all of that. Yeah. I think it's um, a I think it's really awesome because it's, it's, oftentimes this doesn't get talked about, but it's a really good allegory and it's a very important allegory. Can I explain yeah. to you why I think this is so, um, why I love how this interla- um, overlaps with Defenders of Peace? 
Oh, go by all means. Tiwat Ka on. and Chairman Cho are the exact opposite. Tiwat Ka wants peace no matter what. How does that work for him? His planet gets taken over by the separatists who test their defoliator tank on his people. Rough. Chairman Cho uh, is wants to be all war. How does that work out for him? Dead by the end of the episode. Killed by the very savages he wanted to rail against, basically. Yeah. Um, which shows us one thing. Neither of the extremes in a story, in a franchise, where... All you hear about all day and all night, what you hear, the light side and the dark side, good and evil. What do we see? All peace is not sustainable. And all war is not sustainable. I would lean towards, like, it, again, it's a spectrum. I'd lean towards more peace than war. But again, neither extreme in a series about light side and dark side, the two most obvious extremes ever. Neither extreme is sustainable. Yeah. All definitely. peace does I, I not agree. work. All war does not work. But I do think the ultimate thing is that is this. There was a minor controversy a while ago. Um, there was a video about the brainstorming by Claudia Gray, Daniel Jose Older, Kevin Scott, Charles Soule, and Justina Ireland about the High Republic. One of the yeah. things they had on their whiteboard was that Star Wars is anti-war. And some people did not get that. This episode right here is why. I, I don't know. I think it's pretty clear that Star Wars is anti-war, even from the very beginning. Like, if you yeah. if you look at what happens, in if we look at the prequels and we look at the... Uh, originals. Yeah, and we look and at the originals even, and we look at the Even the sequels, Wars, you know. And, and even the sequels, I feel like looking at it all together, I feel like a lot of people accuse the sequels of being too political, but if you look at everything, I would contend that the sequels are honestly some of the least uh, oh, yeah. politically, uh, they're kind of the least politically aware, and, and they have well, maybe it's... some more surface level messaging, but I feel like all the everything else has a, a lot more kind of uh, a, a deeper deeper commentary, and I think uh, for all for everything I like about it, the Force Awakens and the rest of the sequel trilogy kind of it suffers from sometimes in terms of its its messaging having to appeal having to have the most possible mass market appeal, which means and, being able to and make like, it you know, having to, The sequel trilogy in a lot of ways was an impossible task, so they could not cover everything they wanted to. Yeah, and I think that's oh, one of the things that was left by the wayside. But I was just going to say about this episode, trespass is why. Um, this is what I wrote, and I think I, and I think I, when I wrote this, I'm, I don't know what I was doing at the time, but I think I hit the nail on the head here. Um, uh, it's a powerful episode about why war isn't all it's cracked up to be. While I love the laser sword fights and cool explosions, it's a good reminder that in a perfect galaxy, none of it would be happening. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I, I think... It's a really, I, I love the um, messaging. I also love, and I think we got into this in our, um, when we were talking about the flora mark. Did we see the separatists at all in this episode? We saw a bunch of battle droid head on, heads on pikes, but other than that, did we see the separatists at all? No. no. I thought that was refreshing that the separatists I love that. weren't the enemies. I was talking to someone today and I said to them about the Clone Wars, when the Clone Wars isn't about the Clone War, that's when it shines. And lo and behold, by the end of season seven of the clone, by in season seven of the Clone Wars, there are three arcs. How many of them have the Separatists in them? Uh, pretty much one. One. They're not in Ahsoka's walkabout. They're not in the Siege of Mandalore, and they're only in the Bad Batch. That's it. That's an interesting point. Yeah. And I love that. I that's great. I think that's where the show shines. When the Separatists are out of the picture, even when the Republic's out of the picture, you know, the Clone Wars gets into Mortis. Mortis has nothing to do with the Separatists or the Republic. Nothing at all. Period. Nothing. And it's great. It's awesome. I love it. The Yoda, the Yoda and the Force arc. Nothing to do with the Separatists and nothing to do with the Republic. Yeah. 
frankly, like even that Siphonius episode, not the new with Separatists. A lot of the later stuff. It, I love this episode because it foreshadows what's to come for the show. It, when it's not just Republic on a battlefield with some disadvantage, Separatists on a battlefield with some other disadvantage, fight. Yeah, I love it. It's great. Personally, I do kind of disagree. I do think that um, I, I do think I do love some of the bigger, more dramatic battles. You know the. I mean, I don't. Pieces, I don't think they're bad. The like, action. Like but I, I love the Mon Calamari arc. I love the um I love the uh Onderon arc. Those arcs are both Republic Separatists fight. Yeah. But, I mean I agree with what you're saying though. I love how the scope of the Clone Wars, the fact that it has six seasons, the fact that it doesn't always Seven. You know, seven seasons. I, seven seasons. wow, yeah, seven seasons. Gosh, look at me. <laughs> seven seasons now. Uh how many how many episodes? A lot of episodes. hundred and thirty three, I think I read. That is that is a quite a deal. That is a great deal of episodes. So yeah, yeah 133 episodes. You know, I love that that it has the room to kind of experiment with these different ideas and go off the beaten path. So we're getting on to everyone's favorite part of the show. Okay, here we go. One quarter portion. Yes, indeed. Let's do That's this. Right. Star Wars opinions. Two opinion questions. Um, you want to start? Or want me to start? I'll start, I guess. Yeah. Okay, so, let's do this. where we ask each other some interesting questions about Star Wars. My first question for you: Which bad guy has the? Which bad guy to you has the most cogent argument about why they do what they do, and would be most like? Which bad guy would you be most likely to join? Do you think makes the most sense? Hmm. Good question. So it, this is like which bad guy Thanos is the most. Yeah, which which bad guy is like? Do you actually think? Oh wait, um, this actually makes a lot of sense. I would. I mean, there was we, there was a very similar question about like which bad guy is the most good. Um, we have. I think he asked a, a while back. Not nece- not necessarily. I no, I, I mean like, but is... like, but like, I my answer like for those two questions might kind of be the same, and it's Thrawn, because he didn't necessarily join the Empire. Because of the Empire, he joined it because they were the biggest fish in the sea at that point. And so... Yeah. Though I'd really, I'd really say, if not for, like, if if Watt Tambor and Nuke Gon Ray and um, General Grievous were out of the picture, I'd say Dooku, you know? Yeah. The Separatists are actually fighting for some pretty decent things. Now they're influenced by the dark side and some pretty greedy business people but like you know some bureaucrats but like you know the separatists have a decent argument um you know mina bon terry was not a bad person we'll see this like much later in the clone wars mina bon terry truly believed what she was doing was right and i think she was fighting for a decent cause too i mean she had yeah. the wrong idea about dooku but that's just one person you know what I, mean? I mean yeah she she had kind of given duped She'd kind of been, that's the thing. She had been duped by Dooku and Dooku took advantage of her and other well-meaning yeah. people who honestly on their own, without all the dark side I mean, influence, Padme, without the droids, without the business corruption or I mean, less business corruption would, would have actually been, been, been doing some serious good in my opinion. Yeah. For the and, public. I, and like, you know, without that, all that stuff, I don't think they'd resort to violence as quickly. Oh I yeah, for they, sure. For sure. They'd have some, like, I think they'd be a, a sub faction of Republic Senators just like um, the, um, what's that called? The uh, commission, no, what's that called? The, something of 2000. Uh, 2000. The delegation of 2000. The delegation of 2000 at the end of the Clone Wars with Padme and Bail Organa and Mothma and all those people. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, yeah. Okay. Mine have to relate to 2020 and Star Wars. Um... We got a, quite a bit of Star Wars content this year. Both my questions are two-part questions, so here's my first question. All right. What is your favorite piece of Star Wars content we've gotten this year? And what's your least favorite piece of Star Wars content that we've gotten this year? Ooh, man. Mm. That is a that is a good question. Oh, wait, what actually, is... you didn't answer your own question. Oh, I didn't. Oh, you're right. Should I do that? Yeah, let's, yeah let's go, go ahead. Answer. Okay, so who do I think is the most cogent villain? You know, I would also have to say uh count dooku you know i think especially in some of the books when we kind of go a little more into his mindset um 
he says about why the Jedi have been corrupt, how the Jedi have lost their way. And, you know, as much as I hate to admit it, I think he's right that the Jedi have kind of... You hate to admit that? I, I do. I honestly do. I, on, I, know, I know I constantly talk about it because I love it as a theme, but I hate to admit it because I'm like a... I love the Jedi. I'm a me Jedi too. guy and I... You know, it makes me sad to see people hate on the Jedi online all the time, but Absolutely. I can see why it happens. Yeah. Especially, okay. if I could go on a rant for a second, since the same people who are willing to straight up crucify Mace Windu for being a little cold with Anakin and Ahsoka once or twice are, are, are calling are, are, are calling Bo-Katan a total boss, but that's none of my business. <laughs> I, I like, okay, okay. I don't like Mace Windu, but you know, I've always had a thing about against Mace Windu. And I love mm-hmm. Bo-Katan, but I know, and I've been seeing, <laughs> and we've seen with this last um, Mandalorian episode, The Rescue, that her morals might not be straight. I never said I liked her morally. I said I liked her as a character. I said she yeah, I think she's an interesting character, but she just yeah, she's, she's a, a badass. Character that it's are... just that she or she's not a good guy yet. Yeah, she's not that, She's just she that hasn't character. Sold me. She's that character that I irrationally hate. She's she's it, my Darth Maul. Yeah, it, you know how you you uh, yeah. If anyone doesn't know, Eli really just Darth it, Maul. Eli both, does not both like both characters. Darth Maul. Dave Filoni can't seem to let go of. Um, <laughs> Like go of the past. Kill it if you have to. <laughs> the only way to become what you meant to be. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, but go ahead about uh, 2020. Sorry, I sidetracked that, but okay. 2020, best Star Wars content versus hmm. Star Wars content. Can, you, can we do a little recap for maybe the major content? We got season uh, two of Mandalorian. Mandalorian. I think Resisted season two was this year, believe it or not. This, Resistance season two is this year. Can we, can we check up on that? Because that seems... Yeah, Resistance season two, the final... Six episodes was this year. Wow. So that was 2019, 2020. That's pretty yeah. crazy. Okay. So I think that. Um, hmm. But let's count all of the season because, you know. Yeah. We'll just count the whole season because it finished and yeah. you know, it's a unit. So yeah. may as well. Resistance season two, the, the Lego holiday special, the Mandalorian um the, the clone wars was this year right the clone wars season seven goodness gracious um feels like so long yeah. ago i'll go with my favorite my right. favorite victory and death the final episode of star wars the clone wars that's pretty good Beautiful. helmet in the snow i still love it's still iconic we got some great stuff this year uh you know a lot of the mandalorian stuff was great a lot of the resistance stuff was awesome the lego star star wars holiday special was amazing Victory and death. Victory and death. Victory and death. Victory and death. Okay. Nice. What was your least favorite? My least favorite was probably, you know, we don't keep up with the books and comics as much as um, some others do, but I really did not like the direction that the Bounty Hunter series went in. Oh, is that um, where they had the they very had unfortunate kill- kill-off? Yeah. And they, oh, and they, and they yeah, haven't I, been I... doing a very good job at fixing it, and I'd really like to see that improve so let's all put it out for that okay um, so my favorite piece of star wars content you know it just came out but um i just i just got, i just got my hands on it actually I'm, I'm reading it but i can i think i don't even have to be done with it for me to proclaim no. it this may be weird as my favorite Are piece of star wars it? content I this year gonna say it. what i told you was true from, from a, certain a certain point, point of view, of view. I'm, I from could talk for hours. I could talk for hours about how much I love from a certain point of view. I just love the. I, I feel like for me it exemplifies what I love so much about Star Wars, which is that everything can have a backstory. Yes. You know, everything like there's a I, what I, I love we about said it is to like Devor, uh, you said this to Devor in our episode with him. Uh, there's no some, there's nothing too niche in Star Wars. Yeah, there's nothing too niche. There's always going to be oh of course there's a story about that of course that's yeah. a thing and i i love that i love we were like discussing it on the stream there's a story about the space lug i love that it's great have yeah, you i love read the it? message Catherine i have not i've not this is i have not got, i've it's actually not so gotten good. that one yet but i'm it is so good all right well i'm looking forward to it but i just like that because i feel like i love the message of uh everyone every, every there's a there's there's room for everyone and we're talking about all the stories and maybe Maybe not everyone has to be like the big uh, 
the big hero who saves the day. But, you know, everyone has a everyone has a story to tell, and and everyone has yeah a life with value, and and maybe not even people. And it just, I just really like. I feel it. Yeah, it just kind of exemplifies what I love about Star Wars, I which is the, the fact that it's a whole. Books as well. It's a whole universe. So yeah. What's your least? For me, what What are you gonna say least? Ooh man, um, this might be a little I, controversial. The heiress. Gonna... No, 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 no. Okay. The Martez sisters was my least favorite oh, piece of content. Really, the Martez sisters are. Yeah, I will hear me I'm, out. Hear me out. Yeah, I'm gonna defend that arc until the day I die. I'm I know sorry. you will, and I I'm here for it. I love that, but I'm gonna tell you why it didn't. Uh, it didn't do it. It didn't for me. do it for you. It, it wasn't push, your thing. It didn't push my buttons, and here's why. So we have season seven of the Clone Wars. It's so hyped up. It's so anticipated. It's the last hurrah for this beloved show. Only twelve episodes. And you only think three it story four arcs. Episodes. I think, frankly, it was a waste. In this last season, this last th- this last hurrah, we wanted, at least for me, I wanted force action i wanted jedi i wanted big dramatic set piece battles i i wanted a big clash of light and dark i i love the marta sisters as a story i think it has a lot of potential i think uh the you just the ex- it it just was not the story you wanted it wasn't the story i wanted it would have been fine in an earlier season but it felt as it felt as though they were squandering this other limit it felt like they were squandering the limited space, the limited space that they had given themselves to kind of put together a, a tribute and a send off to the work that the the crew of the Clone Wars had had been working on for so long, and that had become such a fan favorite. And I think that also four episodes for that arc I thought was a bit too long. I felt like there wasn't enough there wasn't enough motion. Forward. There wasn't enough. Uh, there wasn't enough forward motion in each. Uh, and, and you know, each each one doesn't have to be like the biggest plot twist reveal ever. But neither does it have to have the most action. But I think in season seven, that was something that I was looking forward to. And I think yeah. um, overall, I, I found the season overall all a bit overwhelming. Underwhelming, sorry. Found it overall a bit underwhelming. I think that um, I I, I can't uh. I can't help but mostly put that on, not entirely, but I think, at least in part, I put that I on the Martez sisters. So again, I'm go- I'm just going to say um, that I I'm uh, I understand your on appreciation. I still think that the Martez sisters arc is the best culmination of the non Republic non Separatist Clone Wars that we got, but that's just me. Um, I think I loved how it was completely not about any of that. Um, but anyway, let's get on to your second question. Go. All right. My second question is, what is one book, uh, a yeah, book, maybe even a, a TV show, a, a piece of media? What is one Legends piece of media that you, that you could, uh, if you could bring it into canon, what, what what would you bring in if you had one piece of media that you could bring in from Legends to canon? I'm trying to say. I'm okay, sorry. I, word, I worded that poorly. I apologize. Here. No, no, I get it. Legends media bringing into canon. Yeah. Hear me out here, okay? Okay. Darth Bane Path of Destruction, people! Oh, that is a good Let's note. bring the Darth Bane trilogy into canon as soon as humanly possible. I like that. I really I really like that choice. You know, I haven't read as much Legends books as I would like fewer than I that fewer than I would admit to. I, for I haven't I have how much not I read that much Legends, Legends either, but Darth Bane the Darth Bane trilogy is quite possibly the best bit of Legends of me. That and the Darth Plagueis book, which is kind of a soft sequel to it, to the trilogy, are those four books. If uh, if there were if the entire Legends was just like obliterated, and you could only save like two things: Darth Bane trilogy and Darth Plagueis. That's all you need. Tells you really, wow. everything you need to know about the Sith and about the Jedi and how they function. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that is a that is a good answer. I uh, <laughs> I approve of that answer. Um, you know, this is going to be hard for me, but I would say maybe Fate of the Jedi. I love that series. I think 
bringing that into canon. Um, it, it would have some issues with canon because... It, it would have so many issues. It would have so many issues. But like... I just think that that having, is the Luke. I just yeah. think that that is the Luke Skywalker. I don't want to get into it because I know it's... I, I know we're not going to like get anywhere and it's we're going to be derailed. But I just think that for a lot That's of things... That's Luke Skywalker you want to see. That like The Last Jedi, Luke, like... It just didn't sit well with some of us, and that's like the Luke yeah. Skywalker we wanted to see. And I think no offense, but I kind of think that Luke was a little bit of a Mary Sue, but okay. Um, I mean a bit, but you know he's a, he's he's the he's. I, the I know he's Luke Skywalker, but he gets a little bit too overpowered. He like manipulates black holes, and that was fifteen years ago. Like, well, are yeah, we I mean, really sure we want this? I mean, I mean, you know, either one, either continuity also has its problems. You know, you have. And you, like, have, you have you know, Ray and Kylo and Palpatine, and you know we have Ray and Kylo and Palpatine doing what they do in the Rise of Skywalker. So you know, I, I think either way, you're going to have some problems. But overall, and, that's what I would want to see. Yeah. And also, and I, Luke I and the Dark the, Troopers in Chapter 16 was a little bit of that Luke. Yeah, definitely. I feel like um, people. I feel like the positive response to that was I feel like people. People like to like. There, I'm not saying there's not room for. Like like moral ambiguity and, or or fail yeah. people failing, but I think that that is the. I feel and, like Luke kind of already went through that in a way, and I think uh, that's the Luke that people wanted to see a lot and, a lot and, of people at least. Yeah, and and again, I love how that's the Luke people wanted to see, but it also, if you look at how the Last Jedi works, it completely works with the Last Jedi as well. That it pleases both camps. I I, I yeah. like that. Yeah, I, um, I like that. Okay, here we go. Second we can still we can one. still come together sometimes a if little we want bit. to a little bit if we want to um, we, when we really try hard enough when we, we really try, try. um uh, last question two parter about Star Wars content in 2020 Ooh, all right number one what is the most underrated piece of Star Wars content in 2020 and what was your favorite announcement that we got about the future of Star Wars in 2020? Ooh, that's that's very interesting. Um, do you do you want to go first? I, I have will. some time to think this okay. over. Okay. Um. Well, I think the entirety of season two of Resistance could get the whole underrated thing. I love the Vox Vortex Five Thousand. That's a great episode. Um, <laughs> yeah. There's some other great episodes. Um, the final episode. Uh, what is that of Resistance? Now I'm. I need to look at it. I had this up. Um. The escape is really good. Rebuilding the resistance is good. Um, the new world is very good. Uh, the relic raiders is very good. A lot. There's a lot of great, great episodes of resistance. I'm gonna have to give this to something else though. Here, it might seem like a weird pick for underrated, but I think the Marshall season mm. two, episode one of the Mandalorian gets my pick for the most underrated Star Wars content of 2020. All I right. think people underestimate how incredible of a season opener that was. Like... What did you like about it so much? What I loved is it set up season two as a... as a, Yeah, they totally there to do that season. You know what I mean? Like, they wouldn't dare to bring Cobb Vanth into the Mandalorian. And then they did... Nobody expected Cobb Vanth in The Mandalorian. Nobody expected Cobb Vanth in, in the first episode of season two of The Mandalorian. Nobody expected Boba Fett in the first episode of season two of The Mandalorian. No one. Absolutely no one. There were leaks. Nobody believed them. The fact that they had the audacity to bring a character who had appeared in a couple chapters of a book, to basically the future of Star Wars at this point, is nothing short to me of incredible. You can say all you want about your Bo-Katan reveals, your Ahsoka reveals, and, and, and your Luke reveals. All three of those episodes I actually liked better than the Marshall. But the Marshall is special to me because it did the thing, and it made it work. And it Turned, it also turned Tatooine, which is a planet I swore I never wanted to see again, into <laughs> ten times as interesting. It turned Boa Fett, 
who I hated into a character that I was excited about. Yeah, okay. That's uh, why, in my opinion, The Marshall is the most underrated content of 2020. Um, and the best announcement, I'm going to say the best announcement um, is The Acolyte. I am so hyped about The Acolyte. Um, it is, I, I'm, vi- I'm just so extremely excited um, that we're getting a show at the end of the High Republic era. Um, Leslie Headland seems a re- like a really interesting choice for a showrunner, and I'm very excited to see her take on Star Wars. Um, even though we knew she was going to be doing something, the fact that she's doing this, the Acolyte, is thrilling to me, and I love it. So those are my picks for the most underrated and best announcement. Go ahead with yours. Okay, so for most underrated, I have to say, um, most underrated, I might have to say, honestly, um, I, I honestly, uh, I'm forgetting it from a certain point of view. I just, I just really like it. And I think it's, uh, I think it's a great piece of content. I love the concept. I love how it offers the chance to go explore all these really fun, uh, side stories. No. Yeah. So yeah. That's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. No, I, 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 I yeah. Uh, what's, what's your favorite announcement? Hmm. Maybe Rogue Squadron. I I like I really like Rogue Squadron. I think it's a cool, a, a cool group and the pilots. And I I can't wait to see what they do to bring it into canon. And Are they going to change it? Like what I'm, what's it going to be basically? It's going to be an original say. story. We've heard that Patty Jenkins has confirmed it's an original story. Okay. They're, they may take stuff from the video games and from Michael Pat Stackpole's books, but it's going to be an original story. Yeah. Well, I'm, um, I'm pretty excited to see what it is. Yeah. Uh. Okay. I think that's going to be it. For this episode of Star Wars in a Galaxy. Again, we'd like to thank you all for being with us as we journey through 2020. Next week is going to be the first episode of 2021. And you know what it's going to be? What's it going to be? Here, here's, here's some irony right here. Um, we are going to be looking at a Clone Wars arc with an infectious virus that threatens oh, the no. entire galaxy. And I'm wor- I'm a little worried about it hitting a little too close to home uh, as we're all as all of our lives are being threatened by an infectious virus. But you can't say it's not going to be interesting. Let's just let's just do that. You can't say yeah. it's not going to be interesting. Uh Next week, Blue Shadow Virus and Mystery of a Thousand Moons. Um, the week after that is going to be one year of Star Wars in a Galaxy. So wow. stay tuned for some fun stuff for that. Um, I can't believe it's been a year already. That's crazy. And, and then the week after that is the finale of Season 4 of Star Wars in a Galaxy. So a lot of exciting stuff coming up. Um, make sure in the meantime, check us out on Anchor, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Breaker, anywhere you get your podcasts, we will be there. Follow us on Twitter at In The Galaxy Pod, Instagram at Star Wars In The Galaxy. Check out our YouTube channel, Star Wars In A Galaxy on YouTube. Um, I'm Ochi at OchiFan327 on Twitter. Um, I think that's it. Um, until next time, may the force be with you. Always.